Hey, this is Cardi B. You're listening to The Man Room with Marcus Bridges. People might actually believe that one. Yeah, no shit. (laughs) I'm pregnant. (laughs) Grab a drink. This is The Man Room. What's up, everybody? Welcome into The Man Room. I am your host, Marcus Bridges. Thank you so much for joining me today. Check us out wherever you check things out that are podcasts and podcasts with videos and podcasts with hosts too old to be on TikTok. Uh, Joining me today is somebody that I've had in here before, and I owe him a sincere apology because the last time he was here, we recorded the audio with the webcams, and that was the dumbest thing I've done as a podcaster yet. So please (laughs) welcome back Seth Milstein to the show. Seth, thanks for joining me, dude. Yeah, it's good to be here. I, uh, I'm, I'm, that's not what you should be apologizing for. Though. You, <laughs> for the record, Marcus and I have seen each other uh, outside of the man room uh, like 400 times yep. uh, since since then, and you apologize every time. And <laughs> I appreciate it, and I officially believe that you are sorry. Okay, and good. I accept that apology. Thank you. You know, but I would. The, People don't realize that about me is if you people just say, I accept your apology, I'd stop over apologizing. You right, know? <laughs> right, right. That's what you need to do. That's what we need to do. But the thing you should be apologizing for is uh, this. The I, I was tricked the first time I uh, came in here because this is a podcast called The Man Room. And as a queer man, I thought there was going to be a lot more dick involved. And uh, there's not. And it's literally just talking. <laughs> I, I am sorry, man. I mean, it's okay. Man. I can, it's not for everybody. You know, maybe not. Next time, I'll outfit it with a few more dicks just so you feel a little bit okay, more at home. Cool. Yeah, if you could just get, like, a brothel of cocks up <laughs> against the – that would be great. By the way, Brothel Cock will be the name of my next punk band, too. Uh, okay. <laughs> I like that. Brothel Cock. That's in a very unique one, which is hard to do with punk bands. So. For sure, yeah. Oh, man. Well, we have seen each other a lot because, uh, you know, you, way more than me, have been out uh, really beating up the uh, the stand-up comedy circuit, if there is one of those in Eugene. There is, and I've been doing it as much as possible. It's really, really cool, man. And, and we're going to get into a lot of this because I've got some plans that I, I haven't, I don't know if I filled you in on yet or not, but uh, I, I'm so excited to talk about that stuff. First things first, before we get to anything else, uh, because people like this part of the show, okay. we are enjoying... The only blue ribbon beer that I've ever drank, right. uh, Paps yeah. Blue Ribbon. It's a winner. Yes. It's a winner. It is a winner and a staple in Eugene. And I notice it at a lot of the open mics. You'll notice that this is a, this is a choice of a lot of local Eugene comedians. Yes, I believe that that is uh, it's, um, based on ec- uh, economics more than anything else. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I think that's behind probably about 85% of PBR purchases in this yeah. world, if I'm not mistaken. For sure. But uh, I, I weirdly got used to it just because I used to get it for economic reasons. Yeah. And now I'm just like, well, I kind of prefer it. <laughs> <laughs> taste, man. Taste change when you just pepper yourself with something for yeah. so long. So, um, yeah, PBR. We're also going to be smoking some weed today. we got a really nice pack of sativa uh, pre-rolls that we're going to be enjoying. So this is going to be a fun man room podcast because um, I, I just – and I've told you this in person before, so I'm sorry if it seems repetitive to you, but – I have been absolutely blown away with the quality of stand-up comedy going on in Eugene right now. And I don't know if it was if it was this good for the couple of years that I was kind of out of the scene or if this is something that's happened post-COVID when everybody got back out after all that time not being able to perform. But, dude, it doesn't matter whether you're at an open mic night or a ticketed show or a free show that's being put on at a bar. It's a lineup of killers every single night, man. Yeah, it's been I, – I actually <laughs> – I just wrote a Facebook post about this, and I haven't posted it yet, but uh, because I, I want to make sure the wording is is uh, right. But I am when before COVID, we had our scene being a small scene had a lot of drama, mm-hmm. and uh, that's it's pretty typical of comedy scenes. But since stuff has come back, like the people that are showing up to the open mics, it's like everybody is dropping their bullshit and focusing on comedy. Like we're all there for one reason and it's to tell jokes 
to strangers for validation. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it just seems like uh, it seems like everybody is kind of focused on doing that. And it's like it's the way it always should have been. It's the way I wanted high school to be where, hey, if you don't like somebody, then you just don't talk to that person. But you're right. there to do your thing and, you know, make make your presence there be about that thing, you know, and then talk to the people that you like or whatever. Sure. But it even seems like most of the people that show up, everybody's kind of cool with everybody else. And, you know, uh, I don't like every joke that I hear <laughs> at Steve, right. but I like all the people that I, that, uh, I, I get to interact with, you know, Good. I can, I can honestly say most of the people in the scene right now are people that I would hang out with outside of comedy. And, uh, you know, that's a really good feeling. And it's, uh, it's really nice to not have to worry about like that, that other element of, but so-and-so is yeah. mad at so-and-so because they said this or, and they, you know, twisting things around it. And we're all kind of narcissistic weirdos anyway. So well, sure. I mean, like I'm so proud of us for keeping our egos in check <laughs> this time around. You know, <laughs> I I definitely feel that. And it was funny. I was at a, a local show here a while back, and I was talking to one comedian who said that there was a little bit of drama, and he was just kind of explaining, you know, what was going on. And and I don't want to name names or add fuel to sure. that fire or anything. But the one thing that I thought was, man, Eugene is just not big enough to have drama to have that level We've of drama yeah. all have we all have to work together because there's no place else to go like you're gonna run into the people that you have sure. drama with if you're gonna try to perform in the scene yeah i mean and that's i mean i've seen that even in portland i mean that's a, a much bigger scene than eugene uh, you know uh when i started doing comedy they were i mean there was probably like 200 active comics in portland and uh and like yeah so drama happens but uh, but yeah, like it seems so dumb here. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause I'm just like, we, you know, like, especially when other scenes that are bigger are like having their period of like, of like harmony. You right. Know? Right. And I'm like, oh, we have 16 people and we all fucking hate each other. <laughs> you know? It's like, God, let's get over this. Guys. It, if that mic stand is giving you shit, I can mute it's your mic real quick while you, while you, uh, mess with it so that it's not. Yeah. Cause it's, it gave Anders some issues last week and I, it's just the cheapest piece of shit, but that's why I don't trust it to hold my camera. I only trust it to hold your mic because right. you have opposable thumbs. So, right. <laughs> I feel like uh, there's a weight situation. All right. I think that looks pretty good. good. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, but I hope, I really do hope. And if, if any of those people that might have, uh, have the trappings of drama in the Eugene scene in their head, if you're listening to this, just know that it's not worth it. Everybody's out there for the same reason. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're all either trying to deal with crippling anxiety, right. get that validation that you're yeah. talking about, or have that narcissistic time where we're looking at ourselves in the mirror going, man, you look good tonight. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I used to congratulate myself when I first started comedy just for having the balls to do it. Because yeah. it was just like the hardest part was me walking to the stage after my name was called because it's like that rush of panic comes over you and it's like well there's the fucking door and it's right next to the stage and i could just fucking get out of here and never turn come back and that'd be fine but then yeah i mean you, whatever the sick compulsion is to get a room full of strangers to be like oh i'll bet his dick is small uh <laughs> is like <laughs> we're we're just doing our best. You yeah, know? <laughs> we really are, man. And, you know, I would much rather, if there is going to be any drama, I would much rather it comes from the audience like it did, right. uh, uh, you know, like it does at some of the open mics. It's been, uh, there was one in particular, you know which one I'm talking about, where sure. I kind of lost my fucking shit a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And then I apologized to you like another 27 or 8 yep, times. Yep. So, you know, uh, getting right in there, right down the middle for me. Right. Uh, but... You know, it's uh, it's funny because I also want to tip my hat to the audiences here in Eugene because that's been one time out of since I think the first open mic night I did was back in April. And right. I haven't been to every single one of them every week, but I can definitely say that the audiences have been good, save for just, a, I wouldn't even say a couple of audiences. I will say save for just a couple of people. The yeah, audiences yeah. have been really yeah, good. That night that you're talking about, the I mean, the the worst part of the crowd was like was like three percent of the people that yeah. were there yeah. and uh and everyone else was like kind of bummed about that you right. know and uh yeah i mean uh yeah like you lost your shit a little bit and it was understandable it was funny because the next week 
uh, this, you know, t- completely fresh crowd. And uh, the first comic goes up and he told like, he, he, you know, it's an open mic. So he's trying new jokes. And he told one that no didn't get a laugh. And some dude in the crowd kind of under his breath just went boo. <laughs> and then that comic was like, you know what? You can take your booze and go fuck yourself. And like the room got really, and so I had to kind of go up and be like, hey, we had a real rough week last week. This is what happened. I told the whole story about like the Hector Heckler Collective that we had to deal with. And then that guy kind of got it. And then the rest of the show was fun. We were able to reset. But it was so funny. Just to, I was like, oh, we all kind of got that vibe. But he was the one on stage and he's not a guy that's going to fucking suffer fools. Everybody's still had a gym burn on their knee from the week before <laughs> exactly. that they could feel yeah, yeah. only when it got Everybody rubbed. Everybody was just picking their scabs. <laughs> yeah. And just, uh, yeah, it was a bummer. Well, I mean, but. I got to tip my cap once again to the people that were there because I it took me a week plus to recover from that and get back sure. to it because sure. I was... I, I do not normally, first of all, I wasn't well enough prepared for a heckler because I thought I had been so impressed by the audiences that right. I had never put pen to paper thinking <laughs> about where I was going to go should that happen, which right. is fatal mistake number one on my mm-hmm. part. Um, but when it happened, and I think, too, like I told you, too, that I was sitting right between the two uh, worst offenders for the entire night. Right. Yeah. And so... Rather than sitting there like I normally do and going over my notes and socializing and, you know, just generally enjoying myself, I was just like, you son of a bitch. You piece <laughs> of shit. I fucking hate this lady. Well, and, you I know, mean, we just- could, let, let's get into it. Like, the, the, at the, uh, that was such a weird night because we the woman that was sitting directly to your right was right. heckling the first, like, five to six comics or whatever. And everyone gave her shit and told her what she was doing was not cool. And she just could not control herself. Yep. She was drunk and out of control. And then another woman showed up, and you and she sat like directly to your left, like you were you were the corner of their L. Yes, and uh, we and, were the triangle offense, the three of us. Right. We were Phil Jackson, <laughs> and she was uh, I don't know what sports means, um, but <laughs> she she was I was I used a literary term like an L. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And it, it, that didn't mean loss either. Uh, I know that's <laughs> even though it did sportsy. for me that night. <laughs> sure, yeah, uh, it did for all of us. <laughs> but yeah, so that other woman shows up, and she and she was kind of like coaxed into it by this the first woman. Like she was just like seeing that this was somehow being rewarded with attention, right? And so she started doing it, and then uh, and then there were two women that were sitting uh, at the front table, like. Uh, all, near these other women and they and they were good all night and then one of them started heckling so it was like contagious and then the two f- the first two hecklers consolidated to their table and they created like an entire table it's of, an angry little zit yeah, of people oh uh, uh, yeah it was just a hate trifecta and <laughs> and uh yeah i mean they got i guess they got that attention that they needed and uh and we gave it to them because they were stealing it from us. <laughs> right, which is never okay with us. You right. know, yeah. we're just really fickle about that. Do you need a lighter? Because I have no, one right here. I have good? a lighter in my pocket. Okay, I, cool. I saw you smoking. Yeah, it. I just, I needed to, because I'm dealing with this still. <laughs> like, I'm seriously still, like, trying to fucking deal with it and, and make make peace with it. Because for me, I, like I said, you know, with my experience to doing live events more than stand-up, it was, I you know, I emceed a lot of events. And a lot mm-hmm. of times when you're, Asking for crowd participation and then also kind of telling people after they do their little participation stint to shut up and listen right at the same time, you get some of that back and forth practice with them where you're kind of just comfortable and it's like, no, it's my turn, you shut up and you don't even really recognize it. And that night I fixated on it so hard because... The the ladies that you're talking about, the one to my right that started from the very beginning of the night, Mm -hmm. and I don't like to make fun of people like this because I know this probably isn't something that she can't change, but this is why it was pitted into my brain. She sounded like somebody punched her in the nose 13 years ago and it never healed. (laughs) It was the highest, most piercing voice. And it didn't matter if there was a full room of laughter, right? Her reaction to the joke, whether it be positive, negative or indifferent came over the top of all of the laughter and you could hear it on stage. You can't fault somebody for that. Like the, the timber of their voice or whatever, but, uh, but, but it was yeah, annoying. It was what she was doing with it that yes. was the problem. <laughs> yes, that's very true. She was. No, in- we had. A, uh, we did a show at uh, World Pies. I can't remember who it was. I want to say it was Fortune Feimster, and we had. A, we, you know, there was over two hundred people in the room. Mm-hmm. You know, and this guy comes up to us and he goes, "Hey, man, 
I think you need to give us our money back. And I was like, what's going on? Like, you're not enjoying the show? And he goes, no, the comic is great, but the woman sitting next to us is, her laugh is super annoying. <laughs> and I was oh, like, wow. so wait a second. <laughs> You want me to give you your money back at a comedy show because the person sitting next to you is laughing. And he was like, well, yeah, but... And I was like, no, it doesn't work that way, man. It's uh, They're enjoying themselves. Just enjoy yourself. Yeah, like, it's right. fine. Just, you know? I think that uh, an annoying laugh, like a laugh that stands out at a comedy show, might be one of my favorite things. I don't care if I'm on stage oh, or not. Sure. I, yeah. if I'm If I'm sitting next to that person... Because... What I find from time to time is, and this happened to me at a Nick Swartzen show, and he totally knew it and like yeah. turned and looked in the audience and acknowledged it because sure. that person was laughing longer than anybody else. And when their laugh died out, I mm -hmm. couldn't contain myself because their laugh was so funny. Yeah. And I, I laughed at like basically a nothing. Like he didn't even say anything. And I just kind of was like, ah! you know? <laughs> so, like, yeah. And like uh, the funny thing was the woman that he was referring to is a, was a comic in Eugene at the time. She's moved to Portland since then. Really? So like we had like this extra like, well, no, we're we're protecting our own and go fuck yourself. Yeah. It's a fucking comedy show. People are allowed to laugh. And it, yeah, I mean, like I I know I've, a lot of my friends have, have in, including me, like I have kind of a dumb laugh that's a, a little bit of a signature laugh depending on how funny the thing is, you know? And so, yeah, uh, that's like been a thing my whole life. My parents both have like very loud, distinct laughs and stuff like that so it's like i uh you know like to me it's just like yeah it's fucking laughter man like that's what we're here for it's i mean it sounds like comfort it sounds exactly. like love you yeah know? yeah it does uh, oh man and if i'm on stage it sounds like validation it sounds like my, my dad showing up to all those games but, which weren't sports games they were video games but but still, they still you could have used nice the gallery if he showed up to watch me play <laughs> super mario 2 that would have been awesome uh, yeah, man, it's a uh, it's a different feeling up on stage, and it's one of those things that's easy to get addicted to when people are laughing. And I haven't felt it as much as uh, as someone like yourself, but I do know that it it tickles you in a place that's hard to get tickled there by anything or anyone else. You know, right. that's true. Um, maybe as a musician is another place where I felt that. I mean, even on the radio, it was a little bit different because. You knew they were out there, but you didn't really see them. It was more yeah. the phone ringing. Like, when the phone rang, I got that kind of little yeah. tickle. Like, okay, well, at least I know this one person's got it on. Right. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah, I, uh, and I know that from doing radio stuff. Like, it's like, you always kind of wonder, <laughs> like, how many people are really tuning into this? But, uh, but yeah, with, with, uh, with comedy, it's like, you know, like, it, you know, I because I have I was a musician before. Well, I wasn't a musician. I uh, I was in a band. I sang for a band before I did comedy, <laughs> and like you know, when you're a band that nobody knows or whatever, like you're the opening band for the show, you don't know if people are enjoying it, and <laughs> they're probably not. But every once in a while, at the end of a song, so like, woo, you know, and like you you're like okay, I can gauge by how many woos there were and how many people are in this crowd, <laughs> how much like our art made made uh anybody feel anything tonight and then uh but like comedy it's kind of a lot cooler because you're getting validation by the joke you know right or right. you're not or you're not yeah by the joke or most of the time you're not and yeah. look there's some brave people out there too because you know i i a lot of times have trouble when i'm writing stuff thinking that i'm funny at all like a lot of times sure. like that's not funny you right. know and and I have to hand it to some people because there are people up there that if I was writing what they're saying, I'm like, God, man, I really don't know if I would have the balls and I barely have the balls to begin with. Right. And, but then there's also the people out there too, that we see at each one of these mics that we're talking about that have like 500 jokes in their pocket at any given time. And, yep. and you're, you of course are one of those people that it doesn't matter the, the what's going on in the room that night. It doesn't matter who's in the audience or how many there are or how drunk it is. Uh, there's like, there's just a handful of people right now that I can start naming, but I'm, I'm going to have them on this podcast. So I kind of sure. don't want to yeah. give it away, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, be, but they're just, they've been so good. And that's actually one of the things I kind of wanted to get to. So we might as well just jump into that is this is the first week of what's going to be, if everything works out, which I have no reason to think that it won't, 
uh, four weeks in a row that we're going to feature a Eugene stand-up comedian here on the Man Room podcast. Awesome. And um, we're going to talk about all the shows that you can go to each week if you want to help uh, support the scene. Just watch some comedy. Go out and try it yourself. We're uh-huh. going to talk to people that host those shows, uh, as as we are right now with Seth, who hosts the uh, Slice Open Mic that we were talking about Monday mm-hmm. nights at Slice Pizza in Eugene. And uh, I'm going to give you a taste of, of just some of the talent that's running around here right now because yeah. – there's some people that, you know, have have either never done something like this, like a podcast or something right. before, or people that are just, you know, it's like, how does nobody know about this person? Like, they're so goddamn funny. And yeah. I want to do everything that I can to kind of help that elevate. I feel like a rising tide lifts all ships in this in this sure. sense. And yeah. this is my platform. So this is yeah, how I'm going to try to use it. You know, and Mike, that's, you know, that's kind of what I was saying before about like this new a uh, sincere camaraderie that I've been seeing in the scene is like, yeah, like anybody, like ev- people are just using what they have. You know, sometimes it's just a, a comic who has a car and just offers, hey, w- there's a Corvallis mic tonight. Let's all, you know, I have three spots in my car. And you sure. all offer that. And, you know, and then, you know, sometimes it's having a platform. And sometimes, you know, uh, we have a comic now, a guy who's been coming out for the past couple of mics that's, uh, like, hit the ground running, was funny at his first mic. And, uh, you know, he writes for Eugene Weekly, you know. And so I hope that means that he's going to be doing covering comedy more. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, you know, it's just like everybody has, you know, Everybody's kind of chipping in to to help the scene be the best that the scene can be, and that's uh that's like heartwarming. I get I get like a little bit flummoxed when I think about it. That's <laughs> cool though like, because that shows how long you've been in and a dedicated part of that yeah. scene. You're looking at it almost now like it's like a seven year old kid, and you're like, it's right. That thing's about to start doing stuff on its own. You yeah. Know? Well, yeah. I mean, you've had uh, uh Chris Castles on a couple of times, and when I started doing comedy in this town, Chris was like the only person that was putting shows together. And he, he didn't do it that often because there really wasn't any demand for it, you mm-hmm. know? We didn't have any regular comedy open mics. Like, if you wanted to do a comedy at an open mic, you had to go to a music mic and just be like, I just need the mic. <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> do some spoken word to kind of bridge the gap. Yeah, and you're just confusing <laughs> the fuck out of everybody because, like, they don't know if it's comedy or a poem or <laughs> a story you wrote or whatever, you know? Right. They're like, what is this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's... And like, I mean, it took it took like years to get to the point where like people like were aware that comedy was a thing that they could go see yeah. like, locally. You know, like, I mean, for years we just had like Lewis Black would come to the Holt Center once every two years. Uh, Seinfeld would come through every once in a while. I saw uh, he sh- who shall not be named uh, Cosby. At, oh uh, yes, I remember at the that Holt show. Center I remember that. Rodney Carrington used to come through quite yep. frequently on his big gold bus. Yeah, and it's just like it was like that stuff. And then and then like you know every once in a while you'd see something at the McDonald's and it was like oh there it's starting like something's yep. happening. It's getting to be more than just this once a year event. And you know Ralphie May was coming through the McDonald's. David Tell I saw at the McDonald's. Oh wow, uh, uh, I saw Tosh there and Nick Swartz in there yeah and uh was it tom Segura? i feel like i saw tom Segura there yeah too. he was a, yeah. he did uh he did um mcdonald and then uh and then and then like i started seeing it at wow hall and i was i was like okay well we should start booking stuff with like locals and portland comics and stuff like that and you know we've flourished from there like uh, we have sean Patton coming up uh you know which uh is on your your feet or whatever but uh and that dude's like a, you know he had his own show he was a uh i forgot the name of his show he used to go to bars uh it was him and jay larson and they would go to bars and they would just like hang out at a bar and kind of like uh it was called best bars that's what it was oh, okay uh but it was like one of those you know kind of travel uh foodie but with beer instead of food yeah <laughs> which, right yeah and uh sounds like a real rough gig yeah and the, yeah here's your here's your here's your studio <laughs> money go hang out at a bar and spend it all right yeah here let's <laughs> exploit your problem yeah right. <laughs> fine with me i mean i've been trying to make money off my problems the whole time it's like <laughs> but yeah and uh yeah and sean's done uh sean's done comedy central stuff he's been he has like three this is not happenings oh 
okay. uh, on Comedy Central that you can find on YouTube. He's a hilarious dude. And like, you know, he that's so that's me and Rudy. Uh, we book stuff under the banner of Just Comedy. And uh, literally there is a banner. And uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I think was made by Back Chase. Yeah. Another, another, another Eugene. Con- and it's on right now in the slideshow that I have oh, of yeah. your pictures. Yeah, of the sure. Just Comedy. It's actually... Like I don't think you could have timed that any perfect or any more perfect because those pictures only stay up for ten seconds and oh, then they the, go it's away. Rotating? So, yeah, oh, cool, it's just cool. a random so happenstance. Funny. But yeah, uh, yeah. and that show with uh, with Sean Patton is uh, August fourth at August World 4th. Pies. Yep. yep. And, so uh, get your tickets because it'll probably sell out. Yep. And uh, yeah, you can go to uh, Just Comedy on Facebook or I, I post on Twitter sometimes for it, but. Um, I'm terrible at Twitter because I'm over 40. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't figured out how it goes yet. I, well, I think that the key is to just uh, spark outrage. Right. And then stand back. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see some people that I, I, anytime I see a tweet that has like over a thousand uh, re- replies to it, I'm just like, how, how did you? What did you do? What did you do today? You do yeah. yeah, like what did you do today other than sit there with your neck all craned and just right. sit there and read comments? I mean, I, you know, I, it's so weird, dude. I always think about that. Like how do you conduct yourself on social media? And I don't really think there's a right answer that you could just give to any random person and have it right. be 100% correct. So good luck on this Twitter waters. Those are the ones that I haven't actually fared into yet. That's yeah. the one platform I'm not on. Twitter, I like um, – I, I just, I feel like Twitter was like the weirdo, like the, I'd send all my weirder jokes to Twitter okay because I'm like, I don't really get much engagement on Twitter. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm just like, let's just let those fall by the wayside. Yeah, I gotcha. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, social media has become, it's like beyond me at this point. I know how to operate on Facebook. I know how to promote myself and my shows that I'm producing beyond that. I'm just like, well anyone's guess yeah right and i just ask my son <laughs> stuff all the time <laughs> which is a gotta be a good thing to have somebody that's uh, that can answer those questions from a younger perspective because half the time that i'm about to put something actually i say half the time let's go with 75 percent to sure. be fair when i'm about to post something on twitter and i'm hovering over the post button <laughs> i go remember that you're a straight white 36 year old male and nobody wants to hear from you, you know? And then and that, that echoes in my head and I go, okay, we can edit like two sentences out of this. Dude, you do know? you understand how great the fucking world would be if every dude that was just a straight white male over the age of 30 thought that before he posted a tweet? Well, like, dude, it's been beaten into me, I think yeah. by enough mistakes and slip ups and stub toes, if you will. Yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah. And I really do like, Maybe it's something that everybody should just ask, and it doesn't matter if you're the 36-year-old straight white male. I think it would be the biggest problem solver if that age group and that, that group of people definitely went after themselves. But right. it's probably good for everybody to, to do that. One thing I will tell you is social media will get a lot more boring because, right, you know, sure. I, like I said. There I, wouldn't be the those fights it, constantly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which maybe things for maybe things would start to change for the better if we didn't all fight with one another. On, so I don't know. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not I here just to noticed, solve problems. I just noticed that the guys that you see complaining, like you, you'll always see some white comic complaining about how, like, because of the way the world is now, all the women and the people of color are taking his spots on comedy shows. And then you're just like, and it never feels like every fucking time it's a comic who sucks. Yeah, it just isn't yeah. doing well. Yeah, they just are not good at comedy. They're just try- looking for anyone to blame. And th- like that happens a lot. Uh, I mean, but especially like before pandemics and stuff like that, like you would just see that. Like anyone just... Like anytime they didn't get a show that they wanted to get, they com- they talk shit about the people who did get it, and it's like you know what? Uh, if you would just shut the fuck up and earn it, you'd get on that show. You'd right. be on it next year, right? You know, and uh, and uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. I and you know, like I said, we are narcissists. We all live in our egos to some extent, and it's just a matter of of like taking a step back and looking at the world. And it's like, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I guess. Uh, straight white men have been doing doing us 
dirty for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And and when I when I say that, I mean like fucking up the reputation right. of straight white men. <laughs> right. And because there's still a lot of them doing it. I yeah. mean, come on. And there yeah, it's like, you know, well I I thought it was hilarious that Joe Rogan is like complaining that like white guys can't say anything anymore. And I'm like, dude, you have a three hour radio show every day <laughs> and hundreds of thousands of people listen to it every day. People are listening yeah. and you have a platform and don't don't fucking pretend that you don't. You, you know? talked about DMT for an hour and 45 right. minutes on yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody you else just gets talk, to do that. You half talk about people beating each other up, <laughs> and the other half you're talking about taking acid in a fucking hyperbolic chamber right. or whatever the fuck you're doing. <laughs> it's like, calm down, buddy. Yeah, it's funny. I uh, <laughs> One of my buddies one time, because I do listen to the Joe Rogan podcast, I, I won't say that I don't. Sure. Uh, one of my buddies one time screenshotted something that like a quote from Joe Rogan mm -hmm. and shared it with me and was like, and it, but he did the thing where your friend will share it with you, but they share it in a text group of people. So yeah. it's like, they almost kind of grandstand you and call you out a little bit. And like, well, what do you think about this Marcus? And I was like, is it not possible that I don't listen to that podcast for the the guy that's on it every time, but the people that he has right, that he yeah. talks to? Like, well, that's the thing. That's I've... the fun part about his podcast is all of his guests. He's got the most obscure and wide ranging views, uh, or uh, sorry, list of guests, and that's what I think is the most interesting part about his podcast. Today, it's a comedian. Tomorrow, it's a neurobiologist. Right. You know? Yeah. Like I, I listened to <laughs> the one with a. Uh... Uh, who's the crazy guy? Alex Jones. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Just Dude. because I wanted to hear that. And so it, it's entertaining. And it was super entertaining. And then, but like, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't really have time. I used to listen to like. I used to be in a job where I was in production, and I just was alone for 40 hours a week. And so I listen to podcasts constantly. Now I'm lucky if I get through two in a week. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have like. You know, one that I listen to that's a, a a friend of mine, like a guy that I know uh, through comedy and, uh, you know, kind of just listen to support him. And I think he's funny. And then um, and then I listen to, you know, the other one's just kind of a wild card of like, what's the best guest, you know, like and I was planning on listening to Tarantino on uh, Joe Rogan. But then I listened to Tarantino on Mark Marin, and I was like, I can't listen to that dude's voice for another three hours. It was not a very well-received podcast among no. the people that I know that just, I mean, I didn't even solicit anybody's opinion. It was like, did you listen to the one with Tarantino? No. Right. Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't if I were you because I was bullshit, you yeah. know, or whatever. So I, I I actually haven't listened to it yet either, but I'm curious to know what, what it was like on Marin other than just the voice. Oh, for me, it was just that he's got like real, uh, real obnoxious cokey energy. <laughs> just like I've been in, I've been like trapped by this dude in the corner of a party before. And it just was not my vibe. <laughs> and like, I like the guy's movies and everything. I think he has, uh, he does like some pretty amazing stuff for in cinema. And, uh, and I like how much he, I guess what I love is how much he loves movies. Sure. And uh, bit of a nerd himself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that guy has clearly just been doing Coke for 30 years. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, like I don't, I don't like that obnoxious, like, all right, I want to tell you a story, okay? And then like, he's got real Billy Mays energy, it sounds <laughs> kind like. Of, kind of, yeah. Stop trying to sell me this fridge, bro. I right. just want to get a beer. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what I feel. I feel like he's just trying to sell you old movies that he loves. Right. <laughs> and it's right. just like, just tell me about the movie, man. Like, it's like, I don't, you don't have to pitch it to me. It's already been made. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I'll probably check it out at some point in time. I'm, I'm a fan of some of his movies. I, I'll be honest. I didn't get into like the, I can't remember what was the one with the chick that had the machine gun leg. Oh, uh, it was like uh, that was like the Planet Terror death. Uh, but the machine gun leg was Planet Terror, which was, uh, which was Robert Rodriguez's movie. Oh, okay. And then his was Death Proof, which was death about proof, the guy, yeah. who, the ladies who kick the guy to death. And they basically uh, <laughs> put those out together, right? Yeah, they yeah. put them out as one uh, movie experience called Grindhouse. Right, that's what it was. Grindhouse yeah. is, the, is the name I remember. And those were they they were kind of like an intentional intentional homage to like these shitty movies that those guys grew up on in gr going to see like Grindhouse movies and stuff. But and. The, Honestly, that was my least favorite Tarantino movie, and a lot of people are like, "That's the best one," and uh, they're wrong. So, okay, uh, so what's the best one? 
Uh, In my opinion. favorite movie that he's ever directed was uh, Jackie Brown, um, but I believe that that's based on an Elmore Leonard novel, and uh, I just like that writer a lot. So okay. I was like, cool, a great director is is making a movie of a great writer. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, for me, I go, I go to Reservoir Dogs. That's like probably my favorite like peace by him, like, uh -huh. you know, and I think I love that it was done on such a low budget and it still feels like a, like a big movie, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I like almost all of his movies. I didn't like, uh, hate late. And I was really excited for that one. Cause I was like, cool. It's nice to see his take on a Western, but I didn't really care for that one that much. Uh, I would have liked to see that movie as a play because it all takes place in like one room. Right. And I was like, this would be fucking cool to just see on stage. And yeah. Like see Broadway like people or like something. Really pour themselves into it. Yeah. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, most of his other movies I have enjoyed. And, you know, when I see him in the theater, it really feels like a cinematic experience because that dude fucking loves movies, yep. you know? And it's, it's just nice to, uh, it's nice to like feel that when you're watching something, you know? He was one of the first people that when I was, I can't remember which one of the Kill Bill movies it was because I'm not like a super, you know, huge fan. I just, I, sure. I, I know some movies and I've enjoyed them. And, yeah. But the music that he would pair with some of like the most grisly scenes in, yeah. in the Kill Bill franchise. That's all was, RZA. RZA. RZA did uh, a lot of the music for those. And he, I think he even did like the the noise, like the Foley work. Like oh, okay. He directed like, like making the sword sound sure. and stuff like that. And it's really, it stands out. I mean, it's yeah. really no, like it's great, great audio and great music paired with, you know, cause look, we could all do the like big symphony orchestra during the fight scenes. And right. and you know, when it gets super tense and everything's really high and sharp and when it's in a lull, it's quiet and, and close and everything, but they're using like songs that you've never heard during fight scenes. And it's right. like, why am I feeling like dancing when and that guy just got his shoulder cut off? You yeah, know, like and bands that you've never heard. Like in that scene where uh, she's fighting the crazy 88 and like the music is so great in that scene. But like right before that, he had the five, six, seven, eights were like, which were like, like a weird Japanese all female, yes. like throwback to uh, a kind of doo-wop almost. Yeah. They were kind of like a, they were kind of like a throwback to like sixties surf punk almost yeah. in a, in a, in a very like clean way. And, uh, and like, I ended up like becoming a fan of that band and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, that's, I love like, cause that's such a big part of film is like is soundtrack, you know, like it has to have a good soundtrack, you know, like I love movies that where I own, I, I would buy the soundtrack because mm -hmm. every fucking song was great. Like high fidelity had a great soundtrack, yep. uh, Gross Point Blank is an, another movie that has an amazing soundtrack. They made like two albums out of that soundtrack. Yes, I remember that. Uh, yeah. Empire Records was Empire one Records that you could one. just listen yep. to front to back. Um, you know, whether or not you were into this type Judge of music. Judge Midnight. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I, see, that was, I actually was just going to agree with you on principle because I trust you, but I had never seen Judgment Night. Yeah. So. Judgment Night had a, they did a weird thing for it. It was like a 90s gimmick where they, they, they took a, an alternative band. <laughs> and uh and a rap group and they would pair them together to do a song so it was like uh i think cypress hill did something with like uh with sonic youth and oh, wow. i know That's faith a... no more was with the booyah tribe and like they would just weirdly paired a, and like i think two of the songs were good okay and that was jamaraquai was just by himself <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's just up there confused. Right. Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's just like, well, <laughs> does anybody want to wear bell bottoms? Uh, <laughs> oh man, do you guys like fuzzy hats? <laughs> um, I think you know. I'm going to say this, and people might laugh at me because of it. I don't care. I'll take the judgment. 36 year old white male don't care. Yeah. Uh, the Clueless soundtrack. You know, had a couple of oh, bangers sure. on it, you know? I, yeah. It was, I mean, Paul yeah. Like was that still has, the same that's age. Some stuff, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was like a representation of like a moment in pop yes. culture at that time. <laughs> it was so, a very pink moment. Yeah, like it's so weird to watch that movie and just be like, oh, yeah, Paul Rudd. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then watch him now and you're like, did he get older? He yeah, get older. he never got older. <laughs> it's a, he's still doing it. You know, uh, speaking of Paul Rudd, uh, he recently did the last episode of Conan, 
because, uh, you know, Conan's switching uh, platforms over to HBO. Yeah. And he's been doing a running joke for, like, 27 years yeah. with Conan with that Mac and me. Sp- and they, they pulled it off so amazingly for the last time when everybody should have expected it. And not only did they right. do it once, but they did it twice. Yeah. In the same scene, <laughs> they pulled that same Mac and me clip. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go look it up. It's just yeah. on Conan's last name. I think it was with Bill Hader and, uh, and Paul Rudd. Um, one of my favorite actors in the world. My uh, my wife has some family from. I always get it wrong. I think it's Rhinebeck, New York. Yeah, I was born there. Were you really? I was. Holy shit! Okay, Dutchess so, County. <laughs> and and I I think that so, what I, I wish she was here so I could just ask her because normally I say it's they're from Poughkeepsie. Yeah, Poughkeepsie is uh it's a little bit south of Rhinebeck. Okay, but Rhinebeck's like kind of like a hamlet. <laughs> it's like a very small town. Right. Very um, kind of uh kind of a. Uh, uh, what do I want to say? Almost like a little tourist destination, kind of, where people are going up there to see just that. Yeah, it's a um, like the the main part of the town is like it's like three blocks long. Wow! And then like it's residential to one side, and then it goes to all the municipalities, like the the pool and the schools and stuff are kind of all on the on the left side of the street or whatever. But yeah, it's a I it's a beautiful place, and it's a place where you. You would have to have money to live there for yeah, sure. Right, right. But, um, well, the reason I bring it up is, uh, I, well, a, I had no idea that you were born there, but yeah. Paul Rudd, I think, opened an ice cream shop like in in a town right around there, or maybe in that town. Oh yeah, yeah. And so my wife's family will sometimes send like a picture of the back of Paul Rudd's head as he eats an ice cream cone <laughs> with his kids because they don't want to bug him. But he's That's like, awesome. he's like the gym of their little town when he's in sure. town. Like everybody's all like giddy, but everybody tries to make it as normal as possible right, for yeah. him. You know, Everyone's, so uh, yeah, not, uh, not that, trying to make him feel like a, like a celebrity. That small town yeah, mentality, you gotta you love that. You don't go to Rhinebeck, New York, to feel like a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, it's funny because, like, the people that live, like, in uh, the downtown, I mean, it's a lot of these beautiful old houses and stuff, and so you have to have money. And then, but it's also in the country. So, like, there's a lot of, like, kind of rural, you know, chew guys chewing tobacco <laughs> and and, uh, and wearing their, their hat that they've worn for the five years in a row. You yeah, know, right. Day. It's got grease stains from their body somehow. Like, how did you produce that grease? Where it's got like the salt, yeah. the salt at the edge right there. That's yeah. a point of pride for me because I am a hat collector. Uh, you could definitely say that. I have no less than than hats that I would wear right now. And yeah. I don't admit this very often, but hats that I could just go and throw on probably on the border of 40 that yeah. I'm willing to wear. And then ones that I have worn so much that they start to get that look where yeah, they can tell sure. their own stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, I save those because I, you know, I'm just I'm kind of a, like, I'm not what I would call a hoarder. Like I don't have the problem, but my hats are very special to me and I yeah. have like sentimental attachment to them. So I like pull this hat out that looks like it's, it would, it, somebody died in it. Right. And I took it off as like, that's a keepsake. Yeah. And I have probably another 30 of those. So right. like, it's an, it's an, it's a small issue as far as storage is concerned. Sure. But it used to be for me as a kid, a point of pride when I would get to that point where that hat was so gross that my parents would tell me to take it off and be like, yeah, yeah that's one good hat. Yeah, you in the wore bank. it in man. Yeah. Like, uh, and that, those hats, they, they feel great until they just can't anymore. Yep. Like, you know, until the bill starts coming off and it's poke at you and, yep. and stuff. Yep. And you're like, all right. Or the smell. Sometimes for me, they get, cause like if I'm, if it's a hat that I work in or if I, like yeah. my baseball hats or something like that yep. or my golf hat. The thing I hate really is for golf because I, <laughs> this is a real nerdy thing to say, but the part of golf that I enjoy like second most to the game is the dressing up and looking like a golfer part right, of it. Yeah. I love it. I, I love that you kind of get to joke like, <laughs> look at how nice I'm dressed while I'm out here drinking 18 beers in 18 <laughs> holes. You know, <laughs> so like I like that, but my golf hats will smell of death because how, how far do you go with the, uh, with the golf look? Because there's a, some guys just wear like khakis and a polo shirt and that's their like you know i'm dressing up or dressing down for golf or whatever right and then but i love there's always like some golf guys who look like they also could be in a ska band yeah. like they, they got the checkered <laughs> pants that are like knickers yeah. somehow they got a vest on why are you wearing a vest you're yeah, swinging but, a club yeah <laughs> why are you why are you wearing a white cap with yeah. a with a pinstripe on it like that's hmm. so weird cumberbund interesting choice is yeah. that from taylor made or is that adidas I, <laughs> yeah uh, no um i i do the so i'll do like a nike or adidas or like dry fit you know nice sure. 
uh, collared shirt, normally like three button, mm-hmm. and a pair of shorts. I, I really don't like to golf in pants because I'm sure. a very fair weather golfer, so yeah. I, I want to be out there when it's 90. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing I'll play with from time to time, this year I'm kind of fat, so I've been just doing like the black shirt and like cream or, or gray colored shorts because it hides, you know, like an extra five pounds makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. But in years when I've been feeling good about myself, like I'll go a full on color match where I'm like, today I'm doing blue and I'll have like the blue shorts, the blue and white striped shirt with the blue hat. And if uh-huh. you're looking across the course wondering who's me, you could spot me from, you know, sure. nine holes away. Uh, so. I don't go Payne Stewart. I'm not right. out there with the knickerbocker pants and okay. the Argyle socks, although I've been tempted a time or two. Right. I figured I knew where you were going with the Payne Stewart, but I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so was he, like... he was a professional golfer, unfortunately died in a, uh, I believe he died in a plane accident. I think that was him, but he was the guy who like still dressed like Bob Jones out on the course, like 1920s with the little hat with okay. the button and you know, sometimes he'd be wearing a sweater, but always those pants that you, that uh, you pulled up to the top of your calf, right? Yeah, yeah. And then have those really crazy socks that go up underneath yeah. of them. I uh, I love an argyle sock. Yeah, and so <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I like. I told when I was still married. I told my this might be why I got divorced. Uh, I t- I I was like, I'm gonna try to bring back the argyle sock, and she's like, Well. I mean, I don't know you're, if you're in a position to, to make a fashion movement. <laughs> She's like, you have a goatee, so oh, <laughs> you, you don't know what's going on. But, yeah, look no. at my – that was probably back when, – when was that? Like early 2000s, mid-2000s? Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. It was perfect to look I at the time. I probably had a chain wallet at the time, too. <laughs> yeah, uh, speaking of, like, I, we were talking about the hats. I uh, when, when I moved out of uh, her house, uh, what is now her house and used to be ours, uh, <laughs> I – <laughs> I remember, like, I was like, well, finally I can do this thing. And I st- I was standing on a, on a desk, and I was about to hammer a nail into the border of the top of my wall, and I was going to start doing hats all around. And I was like, oh, no, I almost became this guy. Like, this isn't <laughs> This isn't a thing. Like, this is great if you're a junior in high school. <laughs> like, this is a real cool vibe. But, uh but and I did look to make sure you didn't have that going on before. You so. just haven't been in my bedroom. Oh, okay. all right. <laughs> no, I, I will admit to you as much, and I don't care. Once again, sure, I don't care. But yeah. I we had this one wall next to the closet that was like from the from about waist high up. There was just nothing, and all the yeah. other all the other walls in the room have something. Uh huh. And I just looked at my wife. And I was like, I got a lot of hats. Like, why don't you let me see what I can do there? And so I did this like staggered thing where it's yeah. like a row of three where the middle one's up higher and then there's a two on the sides. Yeah. And there's about 12 and I color coded them. But then mm-hmm. the problem is, is I'm really bad. I'll pull one off the wall and I'll wear it, but then I won't hang it back up. So it kind of looks like somebody had a shotgun full of hats and they shot the wall <laughs> and like, just so there's funny. a bunch of gaps. <laughs> yeah. So I am that guy, but I'm right. married and she still keeps me for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. You know, I like, uh, I always thought about that because we were talking about the hat storage is an issue. It is. Like if you're a, if you're a hacker, I have a box. I have like a huge box that's just full of hats. And uh, and like a lot of them are hats that are kind of worn out, but I keep for sentimental reasons or whatever. And then there's a lot of nice ones in there that I just like haven't, you know, I don't wear them every day. And it's, it's cumbersome to have them around my room. Right. And uh, so I had always thought about that, like getting an actual hat rack or like what's the classiest way to do that. And then uh, I saw, uh, um, during quarantine, I was watching uh, Jesus and Miro, and uh, so they would do it from their homes. And uh, Jesus is a sneaker guy, and so he had these. He had this wall that he had just put sneakers into these like little cubbies, and they all had like they they were clear doors on the cubbies so that you could see what the sneakers it's were like through. A, like a humidifier for sneakers, exactly. Like yeah, a humidor. <laughs> <Our> humidor yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and and so what he would do is he had that as his backdrop for when he would do the shows from home and he would have all the doors open and they open like they would come down and I was like if you could just make those drawers like a tiny bit smaller you could use the, you could that would be a perfect hat system you yeah know? it would be you could have it against the back wall of a closet and it, it wouldn't be out of place it wouldn't be flashy it would be kind of a cool way to do it but um but also that dude's rich because right. there's a show on Showtime. So yeah, it's pretty easy to be like, can I have a like the thing that you do for cigars, but for my <laughs> for my Jordans? <laughs> yeah, you know, say so, yeah, whatever you want, man. Right. Money's yeah. no object. It's funny what people will come up with. Yeah, you know. 
I do want to get a humidor for weed for sure. That would be that nice. Would, that would be. I I actually have a lottery ticket in my pocket, but I haven't <laughs> checked. They called it last night, and I'm like, because I don't, I don't. It's only fun to buy a lottery ticket if you're gonna spend a little time on Zillow and just dream. Oh yeah, because that's what you're buying is you're just buying hope. You know yep. you're not gonna win. Yep. You're just buying a little bit of hope. It's a gift certificate for hope, and right. you get to have that for a fleeting moment, yeah. and then throw it away like everybody else. Right. And I, I do it, like, right before the thing, so I, and then I just don't look at it for a while, and I'm, like, on Zillow, like, okay, I could put the hat, the hat thing there. That would be cool. Oh. <laughs> so, so you almost are stealing hope because yeah. you're... <laughs> I'm overdue. Uh, <laughs> hope owes me a lot. <laughs> yeah, man, it's funny. I, I, I will not buy, like, a Powerball ticket most weeks, but then all of a sudden... It, when it creeps into like the two, three hundred million, all of a sudden yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you'd be stupid not to. When right. really, yeah. it's like okay. I do that too. And then my uh, my brother, I was I was like, yeah, it's up to three hundred million, so I'm gonna buy a ticket this week. And he goes, oh, like you couldn't deal with <laughs> twenty. <Yeah, laughs> like, right. You make a point, but yeah. I just don't want to. I don't want to be beholden to a schedule of hope <laughs> yeah and then you start to break it down and get really weird with your reasons like well the way i look at it is i'm gonna take all the cash in a lump sum guy and for 10 million that means i'm gonna get about like 55 like 5.5 5 right. yeah, million yeah. and i just don't know that that justifies a trip all the way to shell <laughs> you know like it's <laughs> The, <laughs> uh, it's just a yeah, little bit of life true. changing money. I mean, I don't yeah. want to go out of my way for it. Seven Eleven is a block and a half away. <laughs> I'm not doing that for five million dollars. Are you right. kidding me? You know how many people are going to ask me for that two dollars <laughs> on my way to Seven Eleven? You know oh, how many? Uh, you know how many calls from charities you're going to get <laughs> once you do? It's not worth it. It's not worth the hassle. <laughs> yes, I'd be able to have a house that's mine and never have to worry about anything in my life. But but it's a yeah. lot. It's a lot. That whole you know paying off every bill that every person that I've ever loved has ever had thing. Right. Yeah, I mean, it means a lot, but I, I've got, you know, I, I've got shit to do. I was going to play some video games, so I just don't know that I want to walk down. I'm trying to start my streaming career. Yeah. And no, normally I do only do it with the, the 300 millions or whatever, but then I turn my kid on to that, that hope thing, and now he's like, can we win a lottery ticket so we can look at mansions on <laughs> Starting right. them young, man. Starting them young. Yes. Yeah. No, but I I can't I, I don't get into it that often because it's like I'm still actually trying to make my life happen. Right. You know? Like right. hope's one thing, but action is all. Uh, you ever seen those more. people with a huge like I, I and I feel bad for them because like I know gambling is every bit as much of an addiction as as every substance that you can have. You yeah. know, it does the same thing for your brain. It's yeah, just a different function. Stuff, yeah. Uh, I've seen people with like war and peace stacks of just scratchers standing oh, yeah, there and just beep sure. throwing them away beep throw it away beep throw yep. it away and it's like man that is at a that now you say it hope owes you a lot and i trust you on that i yeah. feel like that's those people are waiting to break hope's kneecaps right. like the minute that hope <laughs> comes to them they're gonna fuck shit up because uh i like and for me i sometimes i go through like uh through phases with scratch offs like There'll be a time where every time I leave a store and I have like an extra dollar in my pocket, I'll just be like, yeah, give me a, give me a scratcher. And cause it's kind of fun. And then, you know, you, you go through three or four of them and you're like, okay, I don't need to do this again for like eight, nine months. Right. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have that where I needed that every, every single day, day yeah. 20 or Same 30 times like a video day. Video poker and stuff like that. Like yeah. video lottery, lottery machines. I've uh, like, I see people, you know, we do comedy at, at places that have those, and you see them just sitting there, and they, they don't give a fuck about anything else that's happening right. in the world, uh, especially my comedy. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just like, it's, uh, I, and like, I have friends that do it, but they do it very casually. It's like, oh, yeah, I have, like, a, I bought a sandwich. It, it was 16 bucks, and I get these three bucks, and I throw them in. And then, you know, every once in a while, they win 20 bucks, and like they're fine to stop once that three bucks is gone. Right. You know? Right. And if that's your level of engagement, perfect. Yeah. That's, you're right I where you should be. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, when you see the, I mean, I, I one time spent New Year's Eve in one of those places because it was the only place that I could walk to that had, a, had, would serve alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just sitting in the front and, you know, like those, those Jasper delis oh, or yeah, whatever man. where they're, it's like, yeah. Nice they, front. That's totally just, you're yeah. a lottery store. That's all you like are. Like when you go in there and ask them to give you a sandwich because they're delis, <laughs> you ask them to give you a sandwich and they look at you like, uh, really? All right. Well. <laughs> 
And then they got to, you know, like all the bread's out of date. <laughs> yeah, right. They're like just throwing shit yeah. over their shoulder into the garbage. It's like I, I grew up in New York, so we had bodegas. You know, every every block had a quarter store that you go in there and there's like a can of red beans that has dust all over it and everything. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you guys are just selling weed, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You guys are selling weed and then newspaper. Right. And that's it. That's really what's coming out of here. Yeah, it is, it is, dude. I, but, you know, it's funny. I, I've I've seen a couple of different types of people with the video uh, poker, especially. Not sure. necessarily the video slot machines. Yeah. But, you know, my dad has a buddy who, uh, yeah, and my dad and all of it, you know, he's got poker groups. Like, this guy is, they, they gamble. That's one of the things yeah. that they do for fun. They play a lot of cards. They play a lot of uh, poker and stuff like that. And one of his friends is a guy who was like, he's a, he worked for some electric company. So really good job, really good gig. Never really had a problem with money. Divorced at a, at a relatively young age and was still making really good money, putting his kids through college, the whole deal. Yeah. And this guy will sit down at one of those damn video poker machines and he'll come out 40 minutes later with like $900 off of like a hundred. Yeah. And I ask my dad all the time, is like, is he just one of those gamblers that you only ever see when he wins? And my dad will tell me, he's like, no, he just fucking wins. Like, yeah. I don't know what he knows about those machines, and he ain't giving it up. Yeah. But he just <laughs> fucking wins. And it's kind of like, I like those guys because, yeah, you beat the man. But at the same time, like, you're no smarter than me. What is going on? And tell me how to learn how to do it. Because if you can just print money, it seems like that's that's a rich get richer thing. Like, a guy yeah. that doesn't need the extra income can just go and win money because it doesn't matter to him, you right. know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, those people fascinate me, too, because I know, I know the stereotypical gambler, which is you only ever see the wins— you never hear about a loss. Right. And every single thing was a hot run. You know, right. we were doing good. We were printing money. And uh, I, so this guy confounds me. And I've never talked to him about it. But I also, like, that that right there is, I think, how I could get addicted. I really enjoy gambling. But if I went on a winning streak to beat all winning streaks, you yeah. might never see me in another room. Right. You know? Yeah, for sure. Because I can get used to money, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I've been to Vegas three times. And one time... I, I like did really, really well considering what I started with. Uh, I've never done like amazing cause I don't have money to gamble right, usually, right. but, uh, and then the second time I just kind of broke even. And then, uh, the third time I think I went with like 200 to spend on actual gambling and I lost, I lost it like in a couple hours and then I just didn't didn't do that yeah <laughs> just enjoying the sights yeah you know, i was like yeah great people watching city yeah we were there for a concert so i was like this isn't even about the uh gambling at all you know and yeah it is a really good people watching city um but yeah the uh the i w the first time i went i went for a concert and uh i was like very broke at the time i had spent my money on the ticket and uh and like you know i had a little bit of money for food and that was about it and um I had I had a nickel in my back pocket and I threw my nickel into a nickel slot and I won five dollars. Oh wow. And I didn't know how Vegas worked. So I went and bought a beer and then sat down at a dollar blackjack table. <laughs> and this was after the concert, so I was on mushrooms. And I sat down at a dollar blackjack table in the Sahara Casino at the end of the strip, like like acid to the strip. Does not exist anymore and, actually. They blew yeah, it up. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and I I sat there for uh, for like six hours and walked away with 120 bucks. Wow! <laughs> and uh, mushrooms, man. I I tra <laughs> pretty colors, I man. it all up to mushrooms. <laughs> I was just like I like felt in tune. Like I had the vibe of like what was good and what was not good. When to hit, when not to hit, and I just kept doing it. And uh, what I would do is I would just take anytime I won like like 10 bucks or whatever i'd just take five of it and put it back in my pocket yep. and then so you know yeah i would lose a little bit here and there but then like uh everything that i won i was just kind of like putting in the bank sure in my pocket or whatever you know and it was a really fun night and then i was like well i definitely have gambling in vegas figured out <laughs> and then got my ass handed to me yeah. the next couple of times take but, a bath the next yeah. few times we're like oh that's how this actually works yeah I had a, I went with a buddy one time the night that I pretty much just broke even. Uh, he he was just losing. He had five hundred to spend, and he's just losing the entire time. And he literally got down to one quarter, 
and he put it in the machine and won a thousand dollars. Oh my god! <laughs> and I was like, "You're buying drinks at this." Show. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> that's a and that's a very Vegas movie type thing to happen that doesn't happen most of the time right. to most people. Yeah. Unfortunately, it would yeah. be really cool if it worked out that way because everybody would have a cool Vegas story to tell. But, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we went once with the radio show uh, right when they started flying uh, one or started flying uh, nonstop from Eugene to Vegas. They paid for our whole trip to go down there. And basically it was, we got flight and I think, I think the, I think two of the guys at the radio station got a free room, but we all kind of pooled together and bought rooms for everybody. Cause we took a right. bunch of people down there. And one of the guys that we took down there was, uh, a, a, our old stunt guy. His name was man yams. I don't know if you remember him, but, uh, he, I don't think he was on when I was actually on the no, show. No, no, it would have been before you. Um, but he basically, long story short, he got his his uh, if you want to call it a job with the show by hitchhiking from Toledo to Eugene to try to get on the show one day. Oh and wow! Like, yeah, yeah, that right there will get you on. Like that's yep. all you have to do. But he didn't come. He didn't have very much money, and he wasn't making very much money at the time. And uh, we took him down there, and we got ready to go out one night, and we're like, all right. And he's like, oh, well, I think I'm just going to stay in the hotel. We're like, what are you talking about, man? Like, everybody's going out. We're going to hit the club. We're going to dinner. We're doing all this stuff. And he's like, I just don't have any money, and I want to save the only money that I have for gambling. We're like, okay, yeah. well, how much did you bring? He goes, 20 bucks. <laughs> and this is a I mean, guy that was like, me that yeah, first time, and, yeah. And, and we were down there for three nights, and we had all these plans, and it was a big deal. And so – like seven of us pooled together what little money that we had because I was in college at the time. You know, yeah. Drew and Tanner weren't making huge money at the radio station. Nobody was rich. We all threw in what, you know, $10, $15, $20 $10, $20 that we could scrape up from our own budgets and pooled together like, you know, 100 or 150 bucks for this guy and just said, here, sure. like, that'll get you through the three days. We're happy to yeah. do it. And the first night, Seth, he fucking disappears. And it's like the whole group was together. It's one thing when you've all fragmented and you're all in your little groups, but when right. the whole group's together and all of a sudden one guy splits off, I'm like, where the fuck did he go? And he was all dressed to the nines too, which was yeah. irregular for him in the first place. Sure. And we go looking for him and I walk around and he's sitting at this wolf run slot machine all splayed out in his chair with his nice shoes on and shit. And he's got a, a, a rocks glass with a clear liquid in it in his hand. We go, what are you doing? He goes... Tough run on the uh, wolf run over here, man. <laughs> We're like, what do you mean tough run? He's like, well, first I went over to this uh, to the bar and I bought myself this double Grey Goose and vodka, which is like a forty dollar drink in Las That's Vegas crazy. from a casino That's bar. Crazy. And then he took the rest of that money and went over and shoved it into the first slot machine on the walkway that he could find and yeah. lost it all without winning a single roll. Oof. And it was like, dude, we gave you that money so you could fucking eat, and you yeah. <laughs> just blew it all in at one. And, but that's Vegas, you know. Yeah. It'll do. It'll do it to the best of you, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Which you know, and I'm I, guessing he wasn't the best of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, he did come to Vegas with twenty dollars in his pocket. <laughs> right. so, <yeah. laughs> but all right, well, hey, I I normally only ask for about an hour, and we're already at the hour mark, so I do want to get to some stuff that's important okay. as far as you and comedy is concerned. Sure. We spent a good portion of time talking about uh, the Eugene comedy scene. We will have uh, another Eugene comic in here on the show next week. Don't want to give it away because the listeners like the surprise. All right. um, but I'm very excited about it. Where can we find you? Because this actually, this episode's going to air tomorrow, which is, okay. we normally record these a little bit further in advance. So, um, where can they find you? What time is this dropping tomorrow? This will drop tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Okay, so... You can find me tonight <laughs> <laughs> nice. at uh, at Slice Mike, uh, which is uh, at Slice in the Whitaker. Um, it's a uh, it's a fun little mic. It's a beautiful little space. We're in a courtyard with uh, with a, a vine ceiling. Yeah, <laughs> grapes, uh, right? Yeah, and uh, it, which they're starting to actually like for the grapes are starting to form, and I wonder what the ground is going to look like. <laughs> I was like, be on this, guys, <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's just a really beautiful space and a great stage, and uh, we always get uh, a really good turnout. So um, if you're if you're looking to do something fun, do that. That's free. And then uh, seven thirty sign up, eight p.m. show if you right. want to come down and sign up. Yeah, or, or yeah, and eight p.m. if you just want to watch the show. And then uh, uh, yeah, on August fourth, I'll be uh, at World Pies. Uh, Rudy and I will be hosting the uh, Just Comedy Show 
with Sean Patton, uh, who is a phenomenal comic. Just look him up on YouTube. You will have a great time, and I'll see you at the show. And uh, and then, um, yeah, on uh, the 14th, I'm doing uh, the Pride in the Park. Um, there's a, a bunch of great queer comics on that. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be uh, celebrating the queer community. Uh, so definitely come out to that. And, uh and then I'm usually at most of the open mics in town every mm-hmm. week anyway because uh, I like doing comedy. For um, sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for now, that's all we have going on. I think we're going to be doing a lot more shows coming up at uh, World Pies. Um, we're, I, uh, we're really excited that they kind of are being like really pro-comedy. Awesome. And so uh, I, we're going to be starting uh, – so throw in some Friday showcases in there, and those are going to be super fun. Um we're in the process of talking to comics about doing those, so I can't announce anything yet. But uh, keep, just keep an eye out for that. Go to just Co- or uh, just comedy on Facebook, or uh, the Eugene comedy scene, uh, uh, which which like represents all, you know, any Booker that does stuff in Eugene posts on there. So okay, uh, that's I will link those in to, the uh, in the description of the podcast, so you can find those just wherever you're at. Yeah, uh, and that's about it. You know, um, I'm around. Yeah, you, you can find me. <laughs> okay, good, man. Well, uh, it, I will uh, sneak my own little plug in here, too, since I guess this is happening tomorrow. But you can find me tonight, if you're listening to this on Monday, uh, the 19th. You can find me at the Ghostlight Playhouse down in oh, Medford. awesome, yeah. Um, I will be closing that show, and I'm so happy that Nick didn't put the word headliner above my picture because, <laughs> God forbid, cool. I, I, I've already melted down once. Don't make me do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, I've done that room, and it's really fun, so you're going to have a great time. And from what I understand, uh, just to give it a little plug, too, because I, I've always been you know big supporter. This is my second time down there, uh, and I love Nick. He's, he's doing great things. He told me he's booked out three like August or September or something yeah, like that yeah. with the Ghost Light Playhouse. This will be the last show on July 19th before they have a tap for beer in there, which I know is a very oh, big deal for a lot of people want to get loose in more ways than one when it comes to comedy, and sure. that's more than acceptable. So yeah. um, and, uh, I also know that they're look uh, working on some uh, kind of some cool restaurant stuff there too. So it's going to be a really cool place down there to have in Medford. Yeah. It's already um, a really cool space you it know, is. as far yep. as a, a, a theater goes. And, uh, yeah, that'll just make it so much more fun for sure. Yep, absolutely. So uh, do your part to go out and support. We're going to be doing that here on the Man Room Podcast for the next four, maybe even five weeks. I mean, technically, you could call it five weeks because I did have Andrist on last week. Sure, yeah. And he basically was just saying, like, I, I asked him if he we were going to. a comic. <laughs> yeah, right. And I asked him, I was like, are we going to catch you out in any of Eugene Mikes? And he was like, eh, you know, maybe if I get the itch. So I don't know if we'll see him. Probably yeah. not. But <laughs> <laughs> He's got bigger uh, stuff to do. He but. does, and if you haven't checked out his special yet, you got to go see Andy Andrus last shot just to sneak one more plug in because that's what we're doing right now. Um, and you know, uh, he's a guy that I'm sure you put the right uh, right offer in front of him. He's going to be out on one of these more showcase like or, or feature shows before yeah. too long too here locally. So. Uh, but make sure to check Seth out at all these shows. Um, once again, because I have them right here, uh, the open mic at slice July 26th. You said it was going to feature Sam, Sam Miller, Sam yeah. Miller. And where's Sam from? Uh, Sam is, uh, from Olympia, Washington. He's, uh, one of the funniest human beings I've ever seen. And I'm not just like, it's still a free show. We're going to ask for tips, you know, because he, he's, uh, from Olympia and that's, uh, you know, gas money. Right. But, uh, but. Uh, yeah, he's one like I. He's legitimately hilarious, and uh, it's uh, it's awesome whenever he's in town. He's he's uh, one of my favorite people and comedians. Okay, so that's a week from today. If you're listening on uh, Monday, and uh, but you can come out and check out Slice every single Monday night. Uh, with Seth as your host. Thank you so much, dude, for stopping by. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, and I promise you the audio is better this time, so I'm not going to apologize <laughs> okay. ever again. All right. Sounds All right. good. That's Seth Milstein. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> That's Seth Milstein on The Man Room. Thanks for joining us, everybody. All right. Thanks for listening. And, and the transmission. <laughs>